Me. It is February the 10th, 2024. My name is Chris and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Hello. Just 100%. <laughs> As usual. Um, it's not just another episode of the Future of Photography. It's also Apple Vision Pro Day. Yeah, the future and the present combined the in a moment. Yeah, yeah. It's a, a so point. We, have, we have new gear. Well, we. We do. One person here has new yeah, gear. Collectively, we share our experiences. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is not a, this I'm looking forward to my go on the Teams review unit. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is... Uh, the, what, 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 I, do you have information I don't have? It's kind of difficult because you have to have the, your inserts, your, well, I'll get into it, but, uh, you know, just uh, a, anyway, a quick, a quick rundown. Th this is not a review episode because there no. are plenty of reviews out there that, that do a really good job and we won't be able to do that justice anyway. Mm -hmm. But one of us has one. His name is Jeremiah. And um, just, just, I'll bring you up on the screen here. Just hold it up for a second, please. Here is the... Holy cow, this is that's what a it big comes bag. With. <laughs> it's, the, um, uh, it's the moon boot of bags, isn't it? it it's a very uh, uh, weirdly... Th th I, I can't tell, but it looks somewhat waterproof. And uh, <laughs> it, here, it, it certainly floats the way it looks. Here, is the, here are the guts oh, here. Oh, so it comes with a whole variety of very, very well thought through... Um, inserts and adjustments. I had ordered the Zeiss lenses inserts, um, right. which uh, came very quickly and are extraordinarily sharp. I just like just holding them up as glasses. You really can see the precision I of think Zeiss. Here's a business idea: make f empty glasses frames where you click these in, and oh, you're absolutely. in business. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, I, I think that's a very funny idea. You could probably print them with 3D printers. I, I, yeah, 3D models. Yeah. Somebody anyway. listening to this podcast is already doing it. Anyway, oh. this is a show about photography. And of course, that's we right. want to look at that in the context of it. But you've had it for three days now? Four days? Yeah, since Monday. I picked it up on Monday, which was took an hour in the Apple store of them going through every detail that they could in store. Because you... It's, it would be very difficult to just buy it in a box, walk home and go, here's the manual. It, it is, uh, it's, it's a like learning curve. This, is, this yeah. is not a device for the faint of heart in terms of um, plug and play. Once you get used to it, it certainly is. But it is, um, it is a developer's dream. That, that, that's what I would consider it. it it looks to me it feels to me and having used it for three or four days um it it feels like the kind of device that is its beta version so that uh people get used to it they know it has to happen we talked about this last week when it's lighter cheaper faster uh with more memory um and it won't look you won't look like you're trying to ski down you know, down the slopes, sitting at your desk or in bed, then then I think it will be more of a consumer pro product. Um, I'm not as a camera or as a device for looking at photos. It's absolutely amazing. Um, there's a couple of things that are inside it that I I haven't really heard many people talk about it, but it's called environments. Environments are controlled in terms of their opacity, and they are basically surround. So, for example, the surface of the moon. So you, you, can, you can place yourself on the moon and it'll feel like you're there, but you yes. can breathe, which is a yes, good thing. Yes, you can breathe. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's astonishing in terms of the realism. Uh, it's just astonishingly sharp. Is it like being um, on the real moon then? Have you have you been to compare? <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to compare to, but the lakeside and all the rest of it. It also has lighting adjustments so, in these environments. So someone, that someone said on a podcast that 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 would be a killer feature just just on its own. You yes. just sit next to a calm lake and have a breeze and hear some insects, and you would uh, and 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 I don't remember who said it, but they said. 
they would they would happily pay for additional environments. It, yeah, and I think those are coming. Um, that I I completely agree was one of the most astonishing things because of course Adobe has put in their Firefly. Um, I've put it through some tests basically on apps that are <clears throat> available to the, you know, their Vision Pro apps. Um, watching movies, there's an, IMA <laughs> there's an IMAX app. And like, why go to an IMAX theater? I mean, it is amazing. The sound is amazing. You choose your seat, basically. Yeah. It'll disrupt a lot of things, that's for it sure. It will. Yeah. It will. Uh, the, the movie experience, if you don't um, need to go to a crowded theater and are happy watching <laughs> something by yourself, and we talked about the isolating yeah. characteristics socially that are quite negative. But when you're in a movie, obviously with someone, you're not gabbing. You know, you're sharing the experience that has the nonverbal. You're also not sharing the air with everyone and all the correct. viruses in that air. Correct. <laughs> and so, but the experience of it, I've watched a couple of movies on it. Um, one out of Netflix, which I had to watch um, on, uh, on their um, web because... Adrian, Keep going. Just Adrian just disappeared. He'll, he'll be back in a second. <laughs> he, he, he's going to buy one. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> so even the experience of watching films on the web is pretty good but when you're watching the um hbo or max as we call it or we watch the uh, any of the disney plus which has you know um any number of films and the 3d films they are so amazing because of the way the um f adjustment of the optics to your eye specifically mm -hmm. There's no eye fatigue in any of the 3D experiences that I've uh, seen. So I, I heard that one of the things that it, it's supposed to be really good at is to look at 3D photography, videography. Yeah. Um, and you, as a, as, a, as a director, as a filmmaker, um, probably have to say something about that because I know I know my, my my past experience with 3D movies was always subpar because you'd, you'd have weird shutter glasses and uh, brightness was down and you, you'd lost like a, a stop of brightness when watching and then uh, it's I, not I, ideal I experienced that in the in the um, in the Oculus Quest in the first one, but then of course you have pixels the size of your fist, right? So you have it doesn't it, it's not as enjoyable as it could be. You forget that you're watching 3D within a moment. In other words, it's you're just that in good. The action. You're just in the in in the moment. Yeah, and and um, uh, for example, it has a panoramic mode uh, when you are just looking at your own photographs. Because you, you link it to your iCloud, all your photographs are there. There's a specific um, album for, as we know, for panoramas. Mm -hmm. When you look at panoramas on it, it really wraps around. It's really, you think, wow, that, that's good. And the quality is spectacular. Even so though if, the, the panorama in, inherently is a 2D photo. It's a 2D photo, but the just experiencing your images or one's images that big. I did some right. photo editing. Um, which uh, with was what? Um? With with what software? Uh, I used uh, I used the just a photos app or just a yeah photos app just just rough. Um, I did some mid journey on it, uh, which was a bit kludgy. <laughs> oh, three D and AI. Oh my god! Yeah. I, you know, I just tried everything and and um, Manifique didn't work too well because I think uploading it from the glass to the um, uh, to the mag Magnifique server was not really that's pretty kludgy. I think it's still uploading, but but the um, but uh, Mid Journey worked great. I was using the Alpha because uh, they don't have a Discord that I know of yet. I think it's coming, um, and not that you'd want to. I think the shortcoming of it is typing. Um, the keyboard is is good, but it's very sensitive to the eye. Um, I found Siri to be the best way to do it, and it's very responsive. But taking pictures, which is really what we want to talk about, taking a photograph, which is just basically double-clicking on the 
um, on the top of the optic, optical kind of glass here, you get a 3D picture. And in astonishingly high quality. Evidently, you can shoot 4K video. Have not tried. Over the next week, I'll, I'll take some photos with it and post them on our, um, on our uh, album for uh, people to hopefully um, explore, enjoy, or hate, <laughs> as one wow. does. Uh, but, but um, you know, the, it, they're advertising um, in the capture mode, which obviously capturing a moment of your family in 3D close and replaying it or re-experiencing it as a still is pretty amazing. Um, I think it's benefits with an iPhone 15, which I do not have, and the ability to take really precise 3D pictures and experiencing them through the optics of the vision is a new, I mean, it feels like a new experience. So if we're talking about, again, I'm not, I'm not, thinking of this as a kind of, oh yeah, everyone should have this. This is a camera. Let's go out and take pictures with it. It ain't. It's definitely for nerds. If you see somebody walking around, well, I, you I, know, I, I know that I guy. I shouldn't suggest this to my neighbor just yet. <laughs> no, it isn't. this is, this is um, uh, I think um, Scott Galloway, who's an absolutely wonderful uh, writer and, and uh, teacher and, and um, provocateur, podcaster, said that, you know, the thing about goggles is it's made for uh, incels. <laughs> it's made for young men who <laughs> never want to get laid. And basically, it's, it has a hyper nerd um, kind of presentation. Yeah. But it feels like a test model of what we will see in three years or five years, something much lighter, much cooler, much more interesting with all of those factors. Because the... As so so cameras, are we, are we going to have the Ray-Bans with like, like I, Meta does I, I, now, I think but, so. but with all that functionality built in? I think so. And, and uh, something that um, I'm surprised I didn't get an email from you about is the, uh, I saw an article of the world's smallest camera has just been developed, and it looked like something that would fit on the head of a pin. I, I, we, we, we have, I, I had that just a year ago. That was a, a grain of salt size camera. So, yeah. Anyway, you know, the point is, um, with the with a slightly thicker um, uh, presentation mode on the on the rim, um, yeah. and small cameras all around on both sides. I. Um, I I, I wish I could just sneak into their lab and have a look at what they're working on now. Oh my that God, must, be ready it, it in must five be yeah. astonishing. Also, <laughs> the sound quality, not that we're a sound organized podcast here, but wow. the sound quality not in ear is very surround and it's, it, yeah. you know, it really is very thought, um, right. thoughtful in terms of how they designed it to kind of point the, the, the sound where so, it should be. The thing we wanted to kind of make this episode about is is the apparatus and the art. How does to what extent does the equipment determine your like your artistic expression, your um, your the way you you look at things? Because I know when I every every time I get a new piece of gear, it'll change my photography in some way. It'll have an influence on what I do and how I work and. Um, like be it a different sensor size or different body sure. type of camera or different lens or mirror, mirrored versus mirrorless, all these different aspects to photography and they have influence. This is now changing photography again in a different way because now you have this device on your face and it is a 3D camera. Yes, I, I, I think so. I, I totally agree. When I get a new piece of gear, and it doesn't have to be an expensive piece of gear like this is. This is a very expensive piece of gear. It's a computer. That's what it is. And it costs the same as a fully loaded MacBook Pro. But the, um, the experience of any camera being a small kind of, you know, roughly hewn cardboard camera, taking that out for a spin, one, to understand the aesthetic limitations of the gear is the creative provocation to create. I, that, that is what I always fear, f uh, feel. So no matter what it is, I'm 
always thrilled to explore a new camera. It always delivers to me a different kind of image that I normally would take. And the first thing I try to do, obviously, is take an image that I have taken with other cameras and feel the comparison. Um, obviously, if you're shooting film, it's one thing. If you're shooting film that you can see what's on your screen, in other words, there are cameras that, uh, like the Sofort, but uh, you know, that, where you can see the image and then print it out in analog, that's one. If you can't see it and you have to wait till develop it, that's another thing. Yeah. Every limitation of gear pro uh, provides an incentive for exploration. And it's that's more, the exciting thing. It's more about limitations than p new possibilities often. Yes. I, I, do, I think always, f for me, I, I, and the limitations of, say, this new gear, which I have not taken out to shoot anything, but I will, my instinct is as soon as the, uh, what I'm expecting is the next generation of software, which will allow people to share the environments. So if you had goggles and I had goggles. So you so mean you could, you could be in my messy studio here? Yeah. I don't think you want to. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. I mean, this is this is pretty much just a kickoff. This is a start. This is the beginning, and this is the worst this thing will ever be. Yeah. So we are looking at, I'm pretty sure, a flurry of software development that is either coming to fruition now because people have already started doing that, or it's being kicked off now. So over the next years, we'll probably see some it, it's astonishing extremely things. inspiring for developers in any way possible by the way for if example, anyone's wondering where adrian is just as a little aside his power went out he's <laughs> coming back as soon as he fixed the lights <laughs> yeah it's england you know <laughs> ah poor the poor english no i don't i don't know what happened might might have been a i don't know we'll we'll figure we'll, we'll find out but until then it's the two of us the, talking so Again, comparing it to other, other cameras, um, exploring the limitations of the photography of it, for me will be, oh, walking around my property and taking close-up 3D images. Because I feel you, that's going to Have good. you been out in the street wearing no. it? Because no, I I'm just, I just have this picture in front of my inner eye with you kneeling down next to a, a little dandelion <laughs> with a headset on your head going macro, going really close I would be really much too in. embarrassed, much too embarrassed to wear this in public. I've videos many of have. people doing that. Casey um, Neistat did a really great video of walking around Oh yeah, his, his video, we'll link, we'll link that for sure. Yeah, it's very, very fun. Um, and people stopping you all over the place. But... No, I, you know, for me, it's just really um, made me oddly want to buy a um, an iPhone 15. Though I have a Fuji it, 3D camera. Because it can camera. shoot the the 3D video for the device. Yeah, or or, or stills. I have a, a Fuji 3D um, digital camera, which I have not yet. I, I'm wondering if the um, if the formats are compatible. Uh, in terms of the 3D. If not, I can probably convert them. But the processing power of this thing is significant because you're processing 4K on two eye, processors yes. for two eyes it, quite fast. And and uh, that's a significant amount oh. of, of technology. I have a question to you. The one piece of technology it uses just to be able to to power that in a smooth fashion, all the, all the uh, pixels that it needs to power, is what's called foveated rendering, which means it tracks your eyes and as your real eyes where you look, it's sharp and around it, the resolution is slightly lower. Is that something you notice or is it as integrated? Do, do, do you notice the thing popping I have into, into I'll focus look for where you it. look? Where you really notice it is when you're typing. Because if you click, and the gestures are very simple. You mean typing on the built-in software keyboard? Yes. All right. Yeah. And, and so that will present itself to you. And, yeah. you know, it, that's the weakest part of the technology. Right. But, I heard that, um, yes. There's a way to point at it. There's a way to um, describe it. But I, 
I found the fastest way is be very still and just have the eye look at a letter. When the eye looks at a letter on a keyboard, it it kind of highlights, and then you just click, and you start to and, get used. And the used click to, is the click is this little pinch gesture that's with it. your fingers. Yeah, that's it. Um, so you get used to it, and and also getting used to where to put your hand because sometimes you want to put your hand up here, they but then the, to, the yeah. camera <laughs> you have to keep your hands where the camera can see it because it's like why isn't this working? Um, but but the the interesting aspect of of all of this is the speed at which it tracks your eyes, which I think in cameras going forward, because we all already have a certain amount of eye tracking in certain cameras, but I think applying that to, um, to a viewfinder for a lot of reasons. Like, we for example, that. if you look... We hmm? had that with a few cameras in the past. There was a Canon that had eye tracking built yeah. in where you could like look at what where you wanted the focus to be to a certain yeah. extent and uh, I never had I never used it but people who used it really liked it yeah I, I, I think there is a future in which I tr really subtle eye tracking and one's ability to interact with that to be very conscious of where you're looking which is a good thing for photographers <laughs> in other words are you looking at the front of the tree or the back of the tree that's yeah. that's amazing. You know that will eliminate the. Okay. Um, um, question: We have smartphones. We've had them for fifteen years, and they are taking a big piece of the photography cake now. They are. They have. They have made compact cameras non-existent. They have uh, eaten up a lot of that business. And they are, they are uh, in, in terms of convenience, they are taking away a lot of that. Like today, Monica and I were out uh, to a place where we could have taken a proper camera, but we didn't because oh, we have the phone in the pocket. It's fine. Um, do you foresee the, 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 the head-worn spatial kind of things eat that cake as well? I, I actually, you know, again, I'm kind of, speaking from someone who's like you, you know, very, very, like, I, I like my cameras. Um, but I, I think it, it, it will not replace uh, cameras for photographers who understand the, uh, I, I want to call it the analog feel that connects us with images. Now, maybe that's a conceit that is going to go away. But I, like you, um, I'm always comfortable to take pictures with my iPhone now that the quality is significant. And even if it's a little less, the ability to use Magnifique Con or Topaz or many, any, many aspects, I yes. mean, you can just upscale these things yeah. radically. So, so there's that. And when you have a, uh, a sharp lens and a, you know, a, bo you know, a body that really captures, you know, I'm looking, can I, can I, duplicate the effect of an 8x10 camera on a large print in my pocket. That would be, that's a goal. I want that. But in terms of everyday photography, the difference is, you know, all these little human buttons or all of, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that are stealthy. That's a bit, bit of a danger because how do you know that you're not being photographed. Now, that kind of privacy may just go out the window like so much of our privacy we have I mean, thrown out the window. So we're, we're now looking at cameras the size of a grain of salt. So yeah, what does that say about privacy? Not, let's not get too dystopian here, but things will no. change for sure. Yeah, and, and you, you know, we've talked on this podcast about having so many cameras around that you can duplicate and... and um, go back in time and, you know, really kind of put together massive, very sharp environmental historical moments. Uh, and of course, who's using them, you know, for law enforcement it would be <laughs> ideal. Um, but for mapping, for all of that kind of things. I mean, now when we, you know, when I come into the, um, the when I cross the border back home into the United States, used to be all this passport control. Now I stop in front of a camera. Yeah. I look up. 
and they go move along. And the, you know, the guard just goes, oh, come on, Jeremiah. <laughs> That's it. So, so limitations. When you, when you envision yourself as a photographer using that device as a camera, um, what are the limitations? Um, sexiness. In, in, in its, <laughs> okay, in its current, yeah, in its current uh, incarnation, not in a future Ray-Ban small glasses kind of incarnation. I think it would be taking pictures um, publicly. like in, Inconspicuousness is gone. Gone. For now. Um, I think that the, f the, the art of taking the pictures will mean, if you're using that, that you're really separating yourself out from the environment uh, that you're in. Unlike, like, I think if you have a camera, you're not. I, rem I remember that um, the early ad adver ad yeah. advertisement movie where that uh, father takes pictures of the kids with the Vision Pro glasses on and... It just, it, it freaked me out. It weirded me out. It's not a good thing. So yeah. uh, that is a real limitation. That's why if you use it in conjunction with the experience of a photograph taken with another device, that's good. I, I always think that the major limitations of the technology here are the isolation. Th mm -hmm. That is it. And the more we can shrink that isolation, make us, um, make the environments that we use, or even photography. We go for a photographer walk wearing, you yeah. know, low density goggles, you know, and we're all on a walk together and we, d we are able to share each other's point of view. That would be imagine amazing. That, uh, yes. Yeah. Imagine that as a photo walk or a, or one of your classes. A, and shared, a shared photo walk where in your field of view, you have little windows showing what the others see. Yes. I think Holy that cow. could be amazing. And, and that's, I think, completely possible. Oh, and possible in its current... That's an app that I want to make and become famous and rich for it. And you know that they're, they're work, they must be working on the shared Oh, of course, because isolation... Just, just imagine you wanting to watch a movie with your family and the experience is so good that you want to share that. And right now, we, you can stream it to an iPhone and uh, to an AirPlay receiver. But uh, just imagine you you all sitting together in that environment. Not maybe not with a weird persona thing, but that will become better and over time. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't done that yet, but it, I'm waiting till I I'm waiting till I look better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> better I, I've, I've seen better. people's personas with um, having worn the device a while and then having these raccoon eyes on yeah, the persona. Exactly. Yeah, anyway. And, but, you know, going forward to other gear, because, again, the limitations of this are isolation, weight, yeah. nerd factor, um, also kludgy, you know, kludgy hand-eye coordination. It, 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 it's not natural yet. It's not as direct as a Leica at this point. No. no. Yeah. And, and so, you know, every camera has its limitations as we discussed but exploring yep. those limitations are what i love pinhole camera perfect example there's it's Very so much yeah. fun to shoot with a pinhole camera why because you know you're shooting in a narrow a narrow runway in a very small comfort zone yeah and yeah. so you start to look for what fits that yeah. and and so it heightens your perception by limiting what you can see it heightens what you will see and and uh, i think that's true constantly um in photography um when i got my first casio digital camera i think it was like 200 kb right? i would always try to take pictures that had the, the most blockiness right <laughs> actually explored sure how you can digital make that a feature you can yes. make that of yeah. yeah yeah exactly and and i think that that is um the beauty of exploring new gear and it, it, it's also good for people who are listening photographer photographers here to go and and, and buy it you know a cheap camera a used camera an old camera um that has those limitations and use them 
it's like you're thinking, well, why would I buy an old, you know, digital camera for 50 bucks, right? Because you can get a blocky, weird thing that you're good yeah, instead of buying an app that does that for you. Why, why would you shoot with a with a Holga if you could shoot with a large format four by five? Because the yeah. Holga has a plastic lens and it renders pictures in a very specific way, and it's yeah. it's yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, I'll have one of these gadgets in couple of Soon. years from now. Yeah, in a couple of years from now. I'm not getting first the first and iteration that, just now. Yeah, I, I think the second And iteration, it's not in Germany anyways just yet, so no. we're still waiting. It, but I would have to say, you know, having used it for just three days and really explored it in terms of experiencing film, experiencing my photographs, taking photographs limitly, in a limited way, yeah. trying to edit those posting um, multiple screens that are parked and available uh, in terms of workflow right it blew my mind I'm I'm just a I think I'm afraid of the isolation aspect at this point because I'm I know myself I would probably get sucked in and not re-emerge from that thing for weeks on it. that's why the limitation of a two-hour battery <laughs> I think that's is why terrific. they did it yes. I, and I'm not I'm not kidding it, yes. it, you know when you get that signal you know oh your battery you only have 15 more percent more you're like oh thank goodness all <laughs> right take it off Anyway, by the way, uh, Adrian is not coming back for this episode. <laughs> He's still <laughs> fighting, so um, I'm pretty sure he'll be back next week. Um, let's let's move on to the the picks. Two picks this sure. time, yours and mine. I'll start with yours. What is Studio Ofner? Uh, this is an artist that I, I think is doing the most dazzling work that I've seen in <laughs> so long. Uh, so much th so that I reached out to him, and now we're kind of corresponding. Oh, I see. Um, but <laughs> his, his work is is really worth exploring. Um, if you go to go back to the boat, which is really a, a masterpiece, this one, yeah. If you if this you integrating, just cl yeah, click yeah. Look, every piece of the boat Whoa. was photographed and reassembled. Oh, I now I get it. Okay, yeah. this is wild. He works in in kind of qualities of time and you know exploded. <laughs> I get it. I get it now. Yeah, an, an, ex, an exploded view of something, but it being real, not a. You, you will love this as as you explore this, Chris. <laughs> this is going <laughs> to knock your socks off. I... Uh, also, how he takes nor you know everyday objects puts them into acrylic, hardens them, slices yeah, them, yeah. and creates books. Um, just a way of seeing the everyday just, world. Just as you think that there might not be new things to be thought of and discovered, along comes someone like him doing weird shit. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I love it. He's, he's my new favorite artist. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so I, I brought a very nerdy thing, which is photography related. You know how a, a schmidt Cassegrain telescope works? It's pretty much a mirror telescope. So you mm -hmm. have light coming in through a pane of glass, hitting a mirror, being bounced back into a smaller mirror, a secondary mirror, and that bounces it back into the sensor. And this is the way a lot of big telescopes work. This is also a way a certain kind of lens works. And uh, I came across a guy who, um, he's Dutch, and he uh, is into optics. Huygen Optics uh, is his channel's name. And he found someone who builds uh, schmidt cassegrain telescopes, but in solid state. So we're looking at a block of glass and the whole thing is pretty much almost carved out of a block of glass by a Dutch guy, and he goes to visit him and uh, and see and 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 uh, see how he makes them, and then he go he goes back home and he makes his own and tries it with his camera, which ends up being 
um, which ends up being like a 450 millimeter optic in the size of in in your palm, and without the without the whole like tube around it and things. And then the the Dutch guy who makes these again they they are they are smaller than the palm of your hand. The guy who makes these makes them for uh, as space telescopes. So we're looking at palm-sized space telescopes that do actually go into space. And of course, they have the advantage of being as robust as it, as it can be. It's a, it's a, it's a monolithic uh, one-piece telescope. That, and, that is amazing. And he, uh, and he grinds them. He grinds them on his bench um, manually grinds them the mirrors on the outside and then they get like the mirrored the glass surfaces get mirrored it takes him months to do one of these manually so if you if you have enough nerd in you anyone who <laughs> listens to this uh go dig in and then check out Huygens optics um feed because there he, he made a three-part thing about trying it himself and it's wow so, so, so uh, the the version that will go on an iPhone is a little <laughs> bit away. <laughs> well, I mean, I learned a lot of things about lens grinding, about spheric lenses and aspheric lenses, because aspherical is like very hard to do with a manual uh, production, and I learned why that is, and I learned how. If you have a lens of, for your camera with aspherical elements in it, that how they are made on on very specific CNC machines and things. It's it's yeah, lots to learn. Again, takes takes a bit of uh, t takes a bit of um, let's say stick to itness <laughs> because <laughs> it's very nerdy. But I really enjoyed this. So well, monolithic telescope. That's a terrific. That is really terrific. Anyway, I think I, well, we, we could go on and on and on. But, um, I'm, I'm looking forward to our future with weird new cameras and things. As am I. Yeah. So, yeah. Hold it up again. Hold it up again. Cause Here we go. Here. Uh -huh. The... <laughs> Just, and don't drop it. Go. Don't drop it. The expensive thing. Wow. Yeah, you look like you're going skiing. Anyway, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> that's it for this week's episode of the Future Photographer. We will be back with Adrian in a short while. Until then, everyone, take care and bye for now. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.